time, but I'm tr- I'm a sophomore, uh, co-head of soccer, obviously. I'm a huge Tottenham fan, so don't know what it's like to win, but you know, we're getting there. We'll be there eventually. Uh, yeah, Valentina, if you want to go. Yeah, uh, I'm Valentina, uh, other co-head of soccer. I'm a junior at Rose Hill and a big AC Milan fan. That's my always been my favorite team, so mm-hmm. not doing too bad with that. So. Yeah, you're doing pretty well. So yeah. You so you want to jump right into the presentation? Sure. Yeah, let me share my screen. Work. So we're just going to do, Andy, we're going to do like a like a debrief of common terms in soccer analytics. Hold on. And then we're going to talk a bit about some of the blog posts that we wrote. And if you have any ideas for posts you want to do too, you're obviously welcome to just send them to us and we'd be happy to read them and get them posted up. Is this good? Can you see it? Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Hold on. Okay, yeah, so note that like these are not old statistics, but they're from August. So yeah. some, of the, some of the stuff, it's mainly based on MLS. Um, some of the stuff has like been updated. I tried to like look up some things and see like how much they've changed. And really like a lot hasn't, especially with like some goalkeepers and stuff like that. So it's, I don't know, this is still good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll start off with the basic attacking stats. Um, goals and shots, you probably know what those are. Pretty obvious when there's shots on target percentage, uh, goals per shot on target, free kicks, penalties, and penalties attempted. But the big one right now in, I guess, like the analytics space for soccer is expected goals. And basically um, teams or analysts uh, find that by essentially marking where the shot was taken, uh, like if it was left foot, right foot, header, um, like how long, how far away it is from the goal and like, the position on the goal, so like how, how high it was, how high it was or low it was, and that's a number between one or zero and one. So that could be like 0. 0.9 for a chance, like a foot away from the goal, or like 0. 0.001 from like the halfway line. You know, you get it. It's, it's pretty simple, and that accumulates over the match, and or you can also track it per player, and that kind of tells you how many goals the team should have scored. So, for example, Tottenham. Um, they play very counterattacking defensive soccer. So naturally their expected goals is really low just because they have few chances throughout the game. But a team like Manchester City or Barcelona, like back in the day when they would just attack, 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 hold the ball the entire match, their expected goals would be really high because they would just constantly have the ball, constantly create chances for different players. And whether they scored a bunch of goals or not, that expected goals would always be pretty high. Um, and then goals minus expected goals is kind of tells you how good a player is at finishing. So um, I think I put an example here, Diego Rossi, um, he had a goals minus expected goals of plus two. And that's really good because with the chances he had, he only was expected to score four of them, but he actually ended up with six. And over the course of a season, like I know Harry Kane last season, I think, had an expected goals of like 10, but he finished the season with like 19 goals. I'm like, that's crazy. Like, that's really good. But like a guy like Lewandowski who plays for Bayern Munich and has so many chances over the course of the season, he had an expected goals of like 25, but he only scored like 27, 28 goals, which is still really good. But, you know, tell us how good you are at finishing given all the chances you have. And then non-penalty expected goals, NP, XG, um, that's kind of just goals from open play. I know that I think for penalties, the expected goals is like 0. 0.75, 0. 0.8. And that obviously takes up a lot of expected goals in the, in the match or throughout the season for a player who always takes the team's penalties. So that's kind of the basic attacking stats. Um, if you have any more, Valentina, feel free to jump in. But that's really the ones we've been using so far. Yeah. So... Okay. Or passing stats, um, passes attempted, pretty simple. Completion percentage, pretty simple. Key passes and passes into the penalty area. Um, those aren't as tracked as like assists and goals are, but they still can tell how much value a player is adding in like, you know, the attack sense from a midfielder. Um, I know Bruno Fernandez 
I watch a lot of Premier League, so I'm going to be talking about those players mostly. So I'm sorry. I don't, I don't watch MLS as much as Valentina does, but um, he's been crazy since joining Manchester United. And he, I know, leads the league and key passes since he joined and has been well beyond everyone else. Um, assists, again, I'm sure you know that pretty simple. It's just like player who passed to the goal scorer, he gets the assist counted. And then expected assists is similar to expected goals where um, it's marked on the pitch where the pass was given and then where the pass was received. And if that player received the pass like right in front of goal, that expected assist would be really high. So a player that has a really high expected assist total, um, but only so many assists. So say he has like... Um, an assist minus expected assists of like a positive number, like three, that means that his teammates are finishing better than his passes are. But if a player has a negative, that means his teammates should be finishing better. But in reality, they're, you know, missing the chances that should be really easy for them. So it kind of tells you how good a player is um, helping his team, mostly just attacking midfielders and wingers. These stats are most applicable to, but... Yeah, and then final third or one third, that's just passes into the final third of the pitch. Pretty simple. Progressive passes, those are just forward passes at least 10 yards from its furthest point. So, like, if a team is constantly passing around the back and then they send a long ball forward, that'd be a progressive pass. And then crosses into the penalty area. Again, really simple. Um, I know Liverpool crosses the ball a lot, so they'd probably have a really high crosses into the penalty area stat so yeah cool okay so then we have like basic defensive stats also if you have any questions comments or like examples you want to speak up feel free just, just jump right in yeah yeah please do um but yeah so with defensive stats so obviously we have tackles would be number of players tackled by an individual player um then we have number of tackles in which the tackler's team gains possession of the ball um Press, number of times applying pressure to an opposing player who's receiving, carrying, or passing the ball. And then we have the number of times a team gains possession five seconds after applying pressure. So that's super specific, but it's, I don't know, it, it, it's, it's beneficial. Um, blocks, we have number of times a player blocks a ball by standing in its path. Uh, number of times a player blocks a shot by standing in its path. And then the number of times a player blocks a shot that was on target by standing in its path. So I know like if you look on the right over here, Philly, um, hold on. Uh, Philly uh, over the summer, their midfielder Jose Martinez had um, the most tackled players with 14, I think, and most tackles won and gaining possession after 10 tackles. So he was doing really well over the summer. And then Brendan Aronson, not sure if you know who he is. Um, I think he's with, where, where is he? Uh, Red Bull in, uh, does anyone know? He got traded. He's in Europe now. You're not too sure. Yeah. 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 What's his uh, name? Brendan Aronson. I think he's with Red Bull. Um, oh, there's Salzburg. There's Luxury. Salzburg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but he had the highest number of times applying pressure to an opposing player at 120. And then defender Jacob Glesnes, he held the highest number of clearances at 31. And midfielder Warren Kriaval had the highest number of interceptions at 15. So, yeah, so intercep interceptions are at the bottom. Um, along with number of clearances and uh, number of players tackled plus number of interceptions. So those are some other ones. And then on, I also wrote about the Portland Timbers a little bit, um, just to kind of show the difference between Philly and Portland. So um, in comparison to Martinez, we have Diego Chara, who had the most, um, had the highest number of applied pressures to an opposing player at 143. Um, he also holds the highest number of tackles and interceptions against an opposing team at 16. This is the 2020 season. Um, and 11 interceptions. And then after him is Jorge Villafania, who's a defender uh, with 10 tackles and seven interceptions. And then defenders Zupadic and Mabiala, I think they had the highest number of clearances at 26 each. So yeah, these are just some basic ways to, I don't know, calculate defensive stats. Yeah, another then, really useful one. Oh, if yeah. I can jump in. Um, yeah, of course. Aerial win rate. Like I know a lot of teams struggle with like clearing the ball and like crosses coming in and on corners. Uh, that's the big one that I've seen teams use recently. Um, we should have included that, my bad. But no, uh, yeah, that's another good one. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. We'll add that in there. Mm -hmm. 
And then finally, just some goalkeeping terms. I mean, most of these are pretty uh, self-explanatory, but there's goals against, uh, goals against per 90 minutes, save percentage, uh, clean sheets. So number of full matches where no goals are allowed. Uh, percentage of matches resulting in clean sheets is clean sheet percentage. Then there's penalty kicks allowed, penalty kicks saved, and then expected goals based on how likely the goalkeeper is to save the shot and launch percentage, which is the percentage of goal kicks that were passed longer than 40 yards. Um, and just like for examples in the right, there's uh, from Orlando City is Gallese who had um, five goals against and then his save percentage was 0.737. And then Tyler Miller from Minnesota had a 0.7365. And then I looked it up and um, this, so this was over the summer and now Gallez is at uh, 0.732 by the end. So not, not much changed, but just kind of cool to see like the difference there. Um, and yeah, they have a very different launch percentage. Gallez had 34.2 and Tyler Miller had 52.9. So another kind of comparison there. Yeah, uh, we got all these stats from fbref.com. Um, it's actually like really helpful for all the top five leagues in MLS. They track all of these stats and a bunch more. Um, Definitely like really cool if you're just a fan of the game, just to like learn more about it. Just check out that website and kind of see how the players are doing. I know they're always like adding new stats and mm -hmm. new things to just check out players. So that's really cool. And there's also who scored, which is another really good uh, stat collection collection database. So yeah, and a lot of the time, like what I use for some of these, like for the examples, like I'll go on the actual like website for the league. So I looked at like MLSsoccer.com. Mm -hmm. um, they give you like at the end of the season, they'll do like league leaders or something, which is like, I don't know, most goals, uh, goals against, like shots and targets, stuff like that. They even do like yellow yeah. cards, stuff, which is kind of fun to Yeah, MLS to look is at. definitely like at the forefront of like including all these stats, which is really cool oh, to see. Yeah. yeah. But like That's the European leagues just don't really touch other than like goals, yeah. assists, goals against, stuff like that. So because honestly, stats in soccer, like it's kind of newer i feel like than oh, yeah. a lot of these other sports which is yeah especially like compared to baseball and like oh, other sure. sports where sports were like you know analytics statistics have been a thing for like a while now it's definitely more of like a free-flowing you know kind of like there's only so much you can really capture right it's, it's, i don't want to say it's a game of chance but it, it kind of is it, like yeah never can, a lot of games on. can end up on chance so yeah for sure yeah um, um now you want to jump into the blog posts Sure, let me pull them up. Hold on. Great. Oops, <laughs> not the right one. Hold up. Yeah. Okay. So we can start with your. Do you want to talk about your first one or just your most recent one? I'll talk about my first one. Okay. Um, cool. Yeah, well, that's more applicable to like expected goals and stuff. So. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Do that. Yeah. So I wrote this in August. Um, you know, I was kind of salty that Tottenham didn't win the league, so I tried to show that Liverpool didn't deserve to win. Um, so basically for every match throughout the season, obviously there would be like a goal tally, like, you know, team 1-2-1 one, one or whatever, true, 0-0. Zero, zero. But what I did instead was I collected every single expected goals for each match throughout the season, and then I reconfigured the league to see, you know, how the results would have actually ended up if expected goals were counted instead of real goals. And if you want to scroll down a little bit, I think I have the table there. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it was actually pretty cool to see. Um, Liverpool didn't end up winning the league. Manchester City did. And Le Chelsea actually finished second, which was surprising. But, you know, if you followed the Premier League at all last season, Liverpool dominated from the very first week and kind of breezed through the whole season. I think they clutched the – or, like – qualified or whatever for the title by like April or something, which is like pretty crazy. Or I think it was like, it might've been February. I'm not really sure, but it was very early and they had finished with 99 points. And I think um, the main reason for that was again, like I said earlier, a team like Manchester city who always has the ball and is always creating chances for players like Gabriel Jesus or Sergio Aguero. Um, they tend to have a lot of expected goals throughout the game. But I think the main reason that Manchester City lost the title last year was because of the finishing of those players. Um, they scored a lot of goals, but their expected goals were much higher than their actual. So that was their biggest problem. And it's kind of what screwed them last season. And while Liverpool 
throughout the season, kind of played more of a defensive attack, counterattacking kind of style where they would have few chances, but they were obviously incredible at scoring those chances and also scored a bunch of wonder goals throughout the season that accumulated few expected goals, but really high actual goals. So, yeah, it was pretty cool to see. Um, I know I think there was one team that avoided relegation in mind, but didn't actually avoid relegation in real life. So that was pretty tough, but you know. Do you know who got really? Do you know who got relegated? Yeah, uh, Burnmouth, Watford, and Norwich got relegated in real life, but okay. uh, I think Watford should have stayed up. Yeah, Watford should have stayed up if expected goals were used. So it's it's pretty cool to see over the course of the season how things could have changed if those teams had just taken their chances like they should have. But yeah, yeah definitely. That's kind of the whole point of the article. Pretty basic, you know. If you have any ideas of something similar, you're more than welcome to write it. We'd love to read it. So if yeah, you want to talk about yours, yeah. Valentina? Oh yeah, sure. Um, I was going to say like, if you have any um, ideas about other leagues too, because something too oh, with yeah. soccer as opposed to other sports, there's so many leagues to look at, mm -hmm. you know, that it's almost like, I mean, there's so many players and so many different teams that there, there's like a lot more um, like statistics, you know, mm -hmm. a lot more things that we can look at. Oh yeah, totally. If you have any questions either, you know, just jump in, you know. Yeah, so I did, so my article just got published. Um, I talked about the MLS is back tournament that happened over the summer. Not sure if you know anything about that, but <laughs> yeah, it's, it's okay. Um, I just thought it was kind of cool because it's, uh, I mean, it's never really been done before. Um, and it was so unexpected, like going into it, um, most of the predictions that people had about this tournament, they, you know, they didn't end up working out at all. Like the favorite to win was like LAFC, Los Angeles. Um, I think it was like they had a 17% chance of winning and they ended up you know, being knocked out in the quarterfinals. Um, teams like Seattle Sounders that actually won the whole um, MLS Cup in 2019, they got out in the initial knockout stages so they weren't even in there for that long and um atlanta united who won in 2018 didn't even get past the group stage at the beginning so something like that i just found really interesting and i kind of wanted to find out like in a tournament where it's really hard to pinpoint what could have um like led to the success of the timbers what was the one specific thing that might have helped them along the way so what i did was um i used this website called y scout and I looked at the individual minutes that were played by all of the starters for the Timbers in the first three games of the tournament. And did that for two other teams as well. I did that for LAFC and for the Seattle Sounders. And in looking at, so this is the table that I made, um, in looking at this, of all, I think it was 18 players, um, even though they weren't exactly evenly distributed minutes, there was more of an even distribution than most other teams in the tournament. And I think with that, a lot can be said about the depth of the team and how each player can contribute when they're on the field, as opposed to, you know, tiring out the same players. And, um, you know, especially if it's a tournament, this is not like regular season play where you have a lot of time in between matches. I think it's important to have um, a lot of substitutions, um, enough players that are on the bench that can come in and do their job. Um, and I think that's what the Timbers did really well, as opposed to other teams. Um, so by the end, and they even, you know, I only did the first three games, but even um, up until the end of the tournament, um, they were even adding in more players. Like if I extended the list, there'd probably be like um, a few more players that could be put in there um, that came on, or even some of their like best players, like Diego Valeri, who's the captain, like he didn't even start every game. So the third game in the group stage, he came off the bench. And a lot of the time they would say like, oh, like player coming off the bench probably wouldn't do much, especially him, he's a little older. Um, but he came in, he played 21 minutes against LAFC and he still made a world of a difference. And when he wasn't playing, there was um, Nies Goda, who's a forward, or I guess Abobasi, who's another forward for the Timbers. Um, they were playing in his same kind of position and they were still making a world of a difference as well. So it kind of shows like even the best of the best of the Timbers didn't necessarily have to be playing in order for the Timbers to, you know, win or achieve like whatever desired result they wanted from this tournament and I thought that was kind of cool um, especially in comparison with like other teams that most people thought were actually going to win the whole thing um, so this is kind of the graphic I use for that and yeah that's kind of basically 
what I wanted to write about and uh, yeah. Yeah, it's cool to see. It applies to a lot of the tournaments that are only in European soccer. Like, you know, there's so many more than like most sports where it's like one championship at the end of the season. But for soccer, there's like four or five going on throughout the season. Right. This one was cool in particular because it was like, it was all played in like the space of like a month, wasn't it? Like, yeah, yeah, back to back to back. Cool. Yeah, so it's cool. I could talk about my other article too, if you want. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, so I wrote this, I think, like three weeks ago. Um, it was pretty easy to write because I was just talking about my favorite team. But basically, Tottenham, uh, they've kind of been relying on Harry Kane, Hungman Son a bit too much. Um, I think if you want to scroll down a bit, I think they were scoring like 70% of their goals throughout the season, which is not a good thing because both of them are super injury prone. Mm -hmm. Um, I know Harry Kane just got back from like a three week injury. And I think in that time we scored maybe like two goals when he was away with, from us. So we rely on them way too much and they always end up getting injured. And when they get injured, we lose. So I kind of tried to find some players that we could add in and uh, fill that role. So I used some of the attacking stats that I talked about, like goals minus expected goals, total goals. Um, I think goals per shots on target, just some, stats that can be used for finishing and actual goal creation rather than just kind of like a forward who's there but doesn't really add much actual goal scoring value. So I found a few players that would fit that role and fit Tottenham's budget and wrote it up. It was pretty simple, and pretty easy to write. Um, and yeah, I found three players. Um, I also talked about the other Tottenham players who weren't scoring much. So everyone other than Harry Kane and Young and so on, but found Domenico Berardi, who plays in Italy for Sassuolo. Sassuolo? Don't know how to pronounce that. Porto, who yeah, played for Sevilla in Spain. And Silas Womangatuka, who plays for um, Stuttgart in the Bundesliga. So, yeah, they were all in, like, the 10 million to 40 million range. So, relatively affordable for Tottenham, but you know, we'll definitely fill that role for added goals, what they need, which is they need right now. So yeah, pretty easy to write, pretty fun. Yeah, I really like this one, especially because like, I like seeing the examples that you gave mm -hmm. in different leagues as well. I think I yeah. don't you you know, I mean, the thing that's so beautiful about soccer is you can find a player from like anywhere, you know, oh, yeah. in the world, it's pretty cool, so yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, that's really all we had planned. Um, if you have any questions or comments or ideas for article posts, you know, just let us know. We'd be so excited to read something. So, yeah, I was gonna say I actually read this article. I was, oh, great! Like, wanted to see what the club like did, so I was scrolling. I was like, "Oh, soccer!" So, mm -hmm. yeah, awesome. I thought it was really good because I, yeah, great. I wasn't really yeah. sure what they did, but it's nice. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you want to do something similar for Real Madrid or another team or just players in general that you think are going to break out at some point in the season, you know, we'd love to read that. And we have plenty of resources we can send to you if you want to read, check out those too. I know I mostly use football reference, but um, fbref.com, but uh, who scored, I think, what was the one you mentioned? Valentina Wyscout? I, I had to make an account for it, but oh, yeah. oh. it's still, it's super worth it. Yeah. Yeah. There's a bunch of them, you know, also, just like looking up goals and shots on target, you can find those in like ESPN too or something like that. So, yeah, if you want to write something like this, we'd love to read it and you can get yours out there too. I'm sure other people would love to read it too. 